Welcome to the respiratory exam. Today we will be walking through the respiratory exam using the IPPA format and demonstrating it OSCE style. The first step of a respiratory exam is ensuring that the patient is draped appropriately. This involves getting adequate exposure to the areas you need in the chest and the back. Hi, Shrey. My name is Brandon and I'm a final year medical student here at McMaster University. I'm working with the staff physician that you'll be seeing later in a few minutes. Today we'll be focusing on a respiratory exam. That will entail listening with my stethoscope and feeling both your chest and your back. Would that be all right with you? Yeah, that's all right. Perfect. Before every respiratory exam, you want to make sure that you know the vitals of the patient. Do we have the vitals available? We need to look firstly for general signs of respiratory distress. This involves pursed lip breathing, nasal flaring, tripoding position, accessory muscle use, intercostal indrawing, suprasternal indrawing, and any signs of central peripheral cyanosis that you can pick up uh, just on general inspection. Lastly, you can look for tracheal descent with inspiration and any general difficulty in patient breathing. Next, we can look for signs of cyanosis. Central cyanosis can be seen on the mucosal membrane under the tongue, and peripheral cyanosis can be seen in the fingers, looking for blue discoloration in both areas. Other findings on the hands are signs of clubbing, which is enlargement at the nail bed, and nicotine or tar staining, which suggests cigarette use. We can look for any chest wall abnormalities, which include pectus excavatum, or a concavity of the sternum, as well as pectus carinatum, which is a convex shaped sternum. We can look posteriorly for scoliosis, which is a lateral curvature of the spine, kyphosis, which is outward curvature of the spine, and lordosis, which is inward curvature of the spine. You can assess for any barrel chest thing, which is often seen in patients with COPD and concurrent emphysema. You can also look for any signs of flail chest, which signifies a rib fracture in two different segments of the ribs. This is often seen in trauma. To conclude your exam, you can look for any signs of swelling, erythema, atrophy, or deformities that have not already been mentioned on inspection. Shrey, sure. if it's all right with you, I'd like to perform the palpation part of the physical exam. Sure. Okay. Are there any areas of tenderness right now that I should be aware of? No. Okay. Then the first step is just going to be a general palpation to assess for any signs of masses or irregularities in the chest. We'll also do this on the back as well. You want to verbalize that you don't feel any abnormalities. Then the next step will be to palpate the trachea, making sure it is midline and mobile in all directions. Next, we will assess for bilateral chest expansion. This is ideally done with measuring tape, but in most cases you'll be able to use your hand. With the patient sitting upright, just as Shrey is doing, place your hands at the level of his 10th rib posteriorly. Place it midline on the patient. Now, Shrey, take a deep breath in. Now, deep breath out. Next, we'll do tactile fremitus. In order to do this, you'll want to place the medial component of your hand directly on the patient's back. To optimize feeling the lung fields, you'll want the patient to cross his or her hands in front of them. In this position, You'll want to ask the patient to say the phrase 99 each time they feel their, your hand on their back. Begin at the top of the back and move your hands inferiorly. At each level, assess for any asymmetries in the vibration. Increased vibration implies a consolidation, whereas decreased vibration suggests pleural fusions or pneumothorax. We'll show now. Every time you feel my hand on your back, say 99, okay? Starting now. 99, 99, 99, 99. 
I don't feel any signs of increased tactile firmness or decreased tactile firmness. We will now percuss both anteriorly and posteriorly. It's important to do at least three positions, both sides, anteriorly and four positions on both sides, posteriorly. Increased resonance or hyperresonance suggests a pneumothorax, whereas decreased resonance or dullness suggests consolidation or pleural fusion. Finally, we get to auscultation. You'll want to use the diaphragm of your stethoscope to properly auscultate. And again, to optimize the lung fields, you'll want your patient to cross his or her arms in front of them. We'll begin at the apex of the lungs and listen to each lung using the ladder formation to compare both sides. Normal sounds are vesicular, gentle, low-pitched, and quiet on inspiration and they're nearly silent on expiration. We'll want to listen for any wheezes or crackles. Pay special attention to the right middle lobe, which is located at the mid axillary line at the fifth intercostal space. If you are suspicious of a consolidation, there are two special tests you can use to increase that suspicion. They're called egophony and whispered pectoriloquy. To perform egophony, You'll want the patient to say E for a prolonged period of time. For example, E. You'll auscultate both anteriorly and posteriorly, listening for a transition of that sound to A in an area of consolidation. In all other locations of the chest, you should continue to hear the E sound. Trey, can you please say E for me for a prolonged period of time? E. You will want to perform the same test posteriorly. I do not appreciate any egophony. The next special test is whispered pectoriloquy. You'll want the patient to whisper one, two, three, four, and basically count up as you're listening both anteriorly and posteriorly. The sound should be nearly silent on your stethoscope, but if you hear an increase in sound in a given location, it may suggest consolidation in that region. Trey, will you please whisper uh, one, two, three, four, and then count up? 